Let's crack on YouTube. Uh, excuse my wild ass hair. Uh, I just rolled out of bed. Today's a great day. Today we're gonna wrap up the last two Team Outlooks. Honestly, I'm so excited to get these over with. It was fun to do. Now I have an idea, and as well as you do, have an idea of kind of every single player that's relevant and how I feel about them. But I feel like maybe I could have spent my time elsewhere. Man, fuck this. I'm getting a hat. I'm too insecure about my hair. All right, so let me clarify that. I don't mean better spent elsewhere because this is well spent, but going into making these blog posts, each one. So when I'm writing the blog, that's how I start these off. To get all the information, I start it basically on a, on a blank blog post and I go through each position, quarterback, his weapons, tight end, running back. That probably takes me in total somewhere around two and a half to four hours. Could take anywhere in that range because I want to make sure I get good statistics. I want to break it down well and not just throw out, you know, like, oh, last year he threw for this, this, this. So this year he's going to be pretty good. I want to dive in and give you an interesting point of view on everything. So that takes me anywhere from like two and a half to four hours. Then I have to film them, which takes me probably anywhere from 25 to 40 minutes. It has to upload into the computer, then I have to edit it, which takes me another 25 to 40 minutes, upload into YouTube. So all in all, every single one of these videos, although I know it looks like it's like 17 minutes to you guys, probably takes me anywhere from like five to seven hours to make. So in that same time that I'm doing that with every team outlook, I could probably have knocked off like four or five mock draft videos for each team outlook I did. So there's probably better ways I could have spent doing these videos for you. And that goes with like the top five bust lists and stuff like that too. So, you know, those take a, a while to kind of get together and make sure that you're giving good information to everybody. So shout out to all the people also making like fantasy football YouTube videos. I know what goes into it. So just wanted to get that out there. So next year, I don't know if I'm doing the team outlook. I'm sorry if this took way longer than it needed to do for an intro. Anyways, we're getting back into it with the last two teams in the AFC South. First up, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Let's get it. I'm sorry, I know that sounded like I was complaining. I don't like to complain. I don't like when people complain because you put this on yourself. Whatever you're doing, you put it on your damn self. So that's on me. Let's hit the numbers hard then. Let's get after it. Start off with Blake Bortles, the third overall pick for the Jags back in 2014. There's no denying he's been successful as a fantasy quarterback. He finishes quarterback four in 2015. He finishes quarterback nine last season. But if, if you've ever even watched football, if you've watched him play, you know that that number does not tell the story behind him. The majority of his fantasy success comes from garbage time points. What do I mean by that? Are you new to fantasy football? Basically, if you're on a really, really, really shitty team, you guys are going to be losing a lot, which means in the third and fourth quarter, you're down two, three touchdowns. All you're doing is throwing the ball. You saw it with him and Al Robinson two years ago. That's why they were so, that's why they put up such big numbers, right? Because they were always trailing and they were always needing to throw the ball. So he was throwing it at a volume that was unprecedented. But they made some huge changes in Jacksonville this year, right? They brought in Tom Coughlin, who's looking to change the identity of the team. Through free agency, they have become one of the scariest defenses in the NFL and one of the, the fast and up and coming defenses. Might be one of my, my fantasy sleeper for defenses this year. A lot people thought it was going to be last year, but this is probably the year that they actually provide some value from a defensive uh, fantasy point of view. They added arguably the best cornerback in free agency, A.J. Bowie, B-O-U-Y-E from Houston, probably the best defensive lineman, Clayus Campbell, and they added arguably or uh, one of the top safeties in the market in Barry Church. So they hit all three levels of their defense and they were already pretty good. So now they're going to be a lot better. In addition to that, they obviously took Leonard Fournette fourth overall in the draft. So you can see where this team is headed. Defensive first, run first. Not good for Bortles. Their GM came out, their head coach came out. They've all basically been saying, you know, we don't want to pass the ball. We want to run the ball as much as possible. Someone asked uh, Doug Marone, I think like, ideally how many times a game do you want Bortles to pass the ball? And he answered zero. Like, of course, every NFL team would say the same shit. Like, if you're passing the ball zero times a game, that means you're running it a lot. That means you're probably winning and you're up. But I think that's more so his way of saying, you know, we're going to try to mask Bortles. And you could see that that's their main theme for this season. If you could see it by all, all of the moves that they made. So last season, Bortles forced the NFL's second highest rate of passes into tight coverage 
while finishing dead last in pro football focuses deep ball passer rating and deep ball accuracy. A statistic that he was actually pretty good with in 2015, he was fifth and seventh in deep ball passer rating and deep ball actually took a really bad dive for the worst last year. Uh, that tight coverage stat was from NFL's next-gen stats. Bortles has been supposedly working with a bunch of gurus, whatever, this summer to work on his mechanics, which is great. And I'm not going to completely write him off because he's 25 years old. But, you know, going into your fourth NFL season, that's the kind of shit you do coming out of college, going into your first year, maybe going into your second year. You're not 25. You haven't led an NFL team for four years, and then all of a sudden you're like, ah, you know what? I got to work on my mechanics, and I'm going to turn things around now. That's a huge red flag for not only Bortles as a fantasy player, but how long he's going to last in this league, probably. So going off the board of QB21, you could definitely do worse, but I would not expect anywhere near to top the top 10 numbers that he's been producing the last couple of years. They will keep games a lot closer with that defense. They're going to be running the ball more. There'll be a lot less time on the clock. It's not going to get as much garbage time, which for Bortles is kind of like a, a dagger in the heart. So QB 21, you'll probably get some value there, but you're not taking him in 12 or 14 team leagues. So this is the big one. When I got to Allen Robinson, I have a huge paragraph like this. So you're about to hear a lot of numbers, a big breakdown. What I think about him, he broke my heart last year. He was my breakout. The same way that I'm spitting to you, Tyrell Williams this year is that guy. Like you need to draft Tyrell Williams. Allen, Allen Robinson was the guy I preached all uh, 2014 going into 20, his breakout year. Last year, he was my first round pick in like most of my drafts. So he absolutely killed me. So this year comes around and I'm like, I'm not going to get tricked twice. I need to make sure I get the correct breakdown on Allen Robinson. I am digging in deep on him and y'all won't be disappointed. The big question is whose fault was it? Was it Allen Robinson's? Was it Blake Bortles? Because Robinson was so good the year before. And then he dropped. His numbers plummeted, right? They were plummeting like fucking... Like United Stock dragged that dude off the uh, airplane. His receiving yards went from 1,400 to 883 last year. His touchdown total went from 14 to 6. And I would say there's points to be made from both sides. They both struggled. But let's start with Bortles' uh, weaknesses. So yes, you know you're in for a long one right now. He had about 150 targets, right? 41 of them were considered off target for not even catchable targets, which is 20% of his whole target number. Not a lot to do there. So while you're saying he sees the volume, you know, he's 150 targets, why can't he produce? He's really not seeing 150 targets. He's really seeing like 105 catchable targets. So when you dive a little bit deeper, right? We look back to 2015, that crazy season he had. I'm gonna read these stats up because there's a lot of numbers for you. In 2015, the year that he had, the year that he broke out, he had an NFL high among all wide receivers 46 targets that travel that were 20 yards or more 46 of them 20 of them were deemed catchable 20 of 46 he caught 19 of those 20 that were deemed catchable for 672 yards and three touchdowns so a huge portion of its production you fast forward it a year you look at 2016 last year when the numbers completely dropped off that number of targets of 20 yards or more dropped from 46 to 31 and of those this is the big takeaway here of those 31 only five of them were deemed catchable. So compared to 20 catchable the year prior, only five of them last year. These are numbers from uh, an article from fantasypros.com and these are like signature st stats that would come from Pro Football Focus, but they are no longer letting consumers uh, buy. You could buy it, but it's like $200 for the summer and I'm like, no thank you sirs. So to that point, you could say Borles is really shitty would be the truth. You wouldn't be lying. You ain't never lied. But you could also say that positive regression has to be coming in that category. But other than that, you know, Blake Bortles as your quarterback doesn't guarantee anything. That doesn't mean that he's going to be back to 20 of those being catchable targets. He might go from 5 to 12, which in, in theory doesn't really help Robinson that much. But you know, there's a lot more to look into, right? Robinson didn't really help him himself that much. There were I, I, I watched a lot of their games because I was such. I, I, Robinson was one of my more high owned players. He was a lot of first round picks on him, and I'm watching him. And a lot of a lot of deep balls would hit his fingertips, right? They were like that way from being catch. It, it, it's hard to uh, kind of pinpoint whether that was mortal fault or if Robinson really could have made the plays. But either way, you know, things break a little differently. Maybe we see Robinson hit 1,000 yards instead of 880. But there were definitely some weak points for Robinson, right? He averaged just 2.7 yards after the catch. He was ranked 102nd among wide receivers in that category. And the thing that scares me most is how he performs against really good defenses or def really good defensive backs. He's always someone who's 
put up all his numbers against shitty teams. And when he lines up against like elite or even above average cornerbacks, he does not fare well. And this isn't just last year either. This is just happened to be an example that I found um, last year, but this was the same thing coming into 2015. I remember reading articles about it. He had a stretch from week 11 to week 15. Last year, it's a five game stretch in which he had 31 receiving yards or less in all five games. And you know who he went up against? It was Denver. So it was Tlaib and Chris Harris. Then it was Houston. A.J. Bowie, who, who's now on his team, they got him through for agency. You had Darius Slay of Detroit, Stephon Gilmore of Buffalo, and then Xavier Rhodes out of Minnesota. So those are the five matchups that he had. All really, really, really good cornerbacks. So you can see he struggled against them. Under 31 receiving yards in all of those. And it's a trend we've always seen. I know this point is going to be made in the comment section, most likely. The last two games of last year, when... Doug Marone was named the interim coach after they fired the previous coach and he took over for week 16s and week 17. Number one, we don't like basing things off small sample sizes here at Big Dogs. It never turns out good. Number two, I dove into those games just to make sure because I don't believe that that has any, those two games that his momentum or hey, at his biggest game of the year has anything to do with his 2017 prospects as, you know, Doug Marone magically coming in and now Allen Robinson and Blake Bortles are awesome. So let's look at that, right? Week 16, Doug Marone takes over. He's calling the plays and whatever. Robinson had his best game of the year. He went nine for 147, nine catches, 147 yards against Tennessee. Now, Tennessee was letting every wide receiver eat against them at that part of the season. That was week 16. What I did, I wanted to look at the weeks around that game. Week 14, week 15, week 17. And see how the other wide receiver ones and their offenses did. We found a nice little trend. Week 14, Denver. You had Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. They went 10 for 126 and 11 for 100 and a touchdown. So both wide receivers exploded. You had the next week, week 15, Jeremy Macklin. Six catches, 82 yards. He hadn't put up 50 receiving yards since week four of last year prior to coming to Tennessee and doing that. Then the week 16 game, Allen Robinson. Week 17, it was Houston. DeAndre Hopkins, who had been struggling most of the year. Seven for 123 stat line at Tennessee. So before we talk about how Doug Marone and Allen Robinson you know, turned on some magic, Let's just say that Tennessee was awful against number one wide receivers last year. Their cornerbacks were weakened. They had nothing going for them. So obviously Allen Robinson is gonna eat. So that's my kind of whole outlook on Robinson right now. What I would say to conclude this is I would expect a bounce back here from Robinson for sure. Probably safer to say somewhere in between 2015 and 2016. And I think the 2015 numbers were even a little bit high. So we're gonna scrape a little off the top there. If you average those two years out, you get 77 catches, 1,140 receiving yards, and 10 touchdowns. He's seen the most number of targets over the last two years inside the 10-yard line. So no one has used more than him. Even on a team that doesn't score that much, no one gets as many targets as he does by the goal line. He had 25 of them over the last two years. So with Leonard Fournette here, I'm going to assume that number comes down a little bit because he'll get a lot of goal line rushes rather than fade it to Allen Robinson. So for argument's sake, let's, let's bring that... Uh, number of touchdowns from 10 down to eight. And if we calculate the points out, last year, those final statistics would have made him wide receiver 10 in standard, wide receiver 11 in half point PPR, wide receiver 12 in PPR. And to be honest with you, I'd probably skim those stats down even a little bit more seeing as how he got 150 targets over the last two years. That number will probably come down as well. Maybe he'll see 135 or 140, which skims his number down a little bit more. So maybe like a top 15-ish wide receiver, but he's getting picked right now 31st overall wide receiver 16. The fact that when you look at those deep ball numbers about how he had 20 catchable targets down there, went 19 for 20 in 2015, and only had five catchable targets last year, I really like that number to increase like a good amount. And that's where a huge amount of his production came from. So I like a bounce back year for him. I would prefer Robinson. I'm in the minority here for sure, because I've seen Robinson in some of my play draft leagues slip to fourth, fifth. I've even, I feel like I even seen him slip to the sixth round in a play draft league, which is 10 teams. And I don't think that will ever happen in a real draft, but I prefer Robinson to Demarius Thomas and DeAndre Hopkins this year. Call me crazy, but I'm not reaching for either of those three. Oh shit. That just took up so much time to go through Bortles and Robinson. So we're going to try to zoom, zoom through the rest of this. Behind Robinson, you have the forgotten man, Alan Hearns. He has fallen so far off people's radar after two really good seasons. Last year, he only played in 11 games. He had a slight hamstring tear along with a concussion. So he was on and off the field, just did, was not productive. But you think about his sophomore year, right? He went over a thousand yards, got six 
64 passes and 10 touchdowns. He went over 100 yards receiving in five of the 15 games. So 33% of his games went over 100 yards that year. People were really expecting him to take that next leap forward and he completely fell off fantasy football's landscape. He's just 25 years old. He's 6'3", 205 pounds, so good size for an outside receiver. You know, good size, good speed. He has really good hands. He's proven that through his rookie and sophomore year. So I can't just write this guy off. The reports are saying he put on more muscle this offseason and hopes to stay on the field more, you know, and make sure he doesn't tear any more muscles or whatnot. I don't know if that stuff ever really adds up to that helping, but he'll have to battle uh, Marquise Lee now for the second receiver duties after he kind of opened the door for him last year with the injuries and Marquise Lee slid in and, and made the most of his opportunity. He's going 180th overall wide receiver, like 58 to 60. Strong possibility he could end up as a wide receiver four in this offense. I know they're going to be running the ball more, and I know he's going to have to battle for targets more than he had to, but I, I think he's too good as an actual player to just be written off. So just, just Alan Hearns is just a name to keep in mind because I know what I'm drafting. He's all the way down the wide receiver list and, and just no one is expecting a bounce back from him. So keep him in mind in, in some of your drafts. And as I mentioned, behind him, you have Marquis Lee, right? Also 25 years old, very highly touted talent coming out of USC, was a second round pick in 2014. Hasn't managed to stay on the field at all. That's been his problem. Last year, he finally did when uh, Hearns was hurt. And he stepped up. 851 receiving yards on 63 catches. He only scored three times, but that was a prereq of being in the Jaguars' offense. We really haven't been hearing much out of this wide receiver core besides Allen Robinson this offseason. I'm going to say that given the size, you have Allen Hearns, 6'3", 205. Marquis Lee, 6 foot. 195 pounds. Marquis Lee slides back into the slot. Hearns mans the outside with, whose mans is this? He mans the outside with Allen Robinson. And I think a takeaway here too is, Hearns played 60% of his, his snaps from the outside in 2015 on that big year. And then last year he was asked to run a lot of his routes from the slot. And I don't think that worked out for him that well. Marquis Lee is getting picked 162nd overall. He's before Allen Hearns, wide receiver 55. I would say, because I think Marquis Lee is gonna be the slot receiver, I would prefer him in PPR leagues. But I would take Hearns in both standard and half point PPR. Hearns definitely has the touchdown upside. He has the big play appeal. And we've seen him do it before, right? Like I said, a thousand yards. He's put up 10 touchdowns in a season. So basically what I'm getting at is I don't, neither of them have great ceilings in this offense. There's a lot working against them, but don't forget about Hearns. He's the last one picked out of these three wide receivers. You could have a worse position than Lee in PPR as well. Behind them three, you have D.D. Westbrook. He's their fourth round rookie this year out of Oklahoma. Face a huge uphill battle. He already missed OTAs and mini camp with some undisclosed injury, I guess. He came back at the end of June, like early June though, and he's been practicing with the team. That being said though, he's got three young, promising talents in Hearns, Lee, and Robinson ahead of him. So it's gonna be very hard for him to see field time, especially with his offense now being a run first offense. I don't know, it, it, he's, he's talented, he's young, but he's not. He's no nothing I would, touch and redraft this year. And then you look at the tight end position, it's hard to imagine kind of any production coming from here. They had Julius Thomas last few years, always been banged up. It's been okay when he's been on the field, but he's obviously in Miami now, and they're left with a combination of Mercedes Lewis and Michael, is it Michael or Mikel Rivera, who's a former, former Raider, they got him this off season. And I'm pretty sure like Mercedes Lewis is still being paid from that ridiculous contract he got back in like 2010. I remember they signed him, it was like, five years, like $60 million, and then he's literally been hurt for the last five years. It's out of control, and I think he's still getting paid for that. He hasn't surpassed 230 receiving yards or two touchdowns in any of the last three seasons. He'll probably forfeit a lot of the passing down work to Rivera, who once had some decent fantasy upside. That's all I have to say here. I would not even touch a Jaguars tight end, even in a 2014 league. But here we go, Leonard Fournette. I get a lot of questions on Fournette. What are your thoughts on him? How you doing, how you been? Bada bing, bada boom. So they take this kid, LSU, Leonard Fournette, fourth round overall. He's been a hyped prospect coming out of high school. He's like one well, of the top high school running back. Did not disappoint at LSU. Absolutely just a man beast. Just eats his defenders for breakfast. It's just like a, a Derrick Henry. Really, really big and runs really, 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 really fast. He's six foot, 240 pounds. Runs a 4 5 140, which puts him in the 96th percentile of weight adjusted speed scores. I believe he's dropped his weight this offseason. And as per Evan Silva, the god, this is the fastest 40 time ever recorded by a running back weighing 240 plus pounds. Not really surprising. While the upside is easy to see here, right? The amount of volume he should get, my concerns are, are pretty wide ranging for Fournette. I think a lot of it just kind of both on the fact that he is a rookie and it's not a promising offensive situation for him. You kind of go back and look at rookies historically. I heard it on the uh, Fantasy Footballers podcast the other day. Can't remember the exact statistic, but it was like 
running backs since some certain year that have been drafted in the top 10 on average get like 220 plus carries or it was like I don't know. It was like 80% of them get like 220 plus carries, something like that. Just basically saying that if you're picked really high, you're going to get a high volume. Also, I want to throw out a little stat that I tweeted yesterday. So if you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you go do that. I looked at, because you know, you hear so much hype about rookie running backs now. There are breakout articles for every one of them, whether it's Joe Williams out in San Fran, Jamal Williams out in Green Bay, Samaj P. Ryan in Washington. There's like every article that was written about a rookie running back came to fruition. Every single year we'd have five new David Johnsons. It's really unbelievable. What I did was I looked at, because the majority of those guys were picked in the third round or later, so this is not actually even relevant to like Fournette, Mixkin, Mixon, or McCaffrey. I just wanted to throw this out there for all you P. Ryan and whatever believers. I looked back to the year 2000 and I gathered every rookie running back that was drafted in the third round or later. And it came out to like, I can't remember, I think it was 435 running backs. And then I looked at how many of them as rookies finished as an RB, a top 24 running back in the rookie season. Third round or later, top 24 running back. So that's an RB2 in 12 team leagues, an RB, a mid RB3 in 10 team leagues. Out of 200 or 443 of them, 10 running backs since 2000 have finished as a top 24 running back. So that's basically over a 16 year period, 10 of them. Third round or later finishes the top 10 running back, top 24 running back, their rookie uh, season. So that's basically saying on average, every other year we have a running back that finishes as a top 24 running back that's a rookie third round or later. Last year, that was Jordan Howard. So again, on average, we're not even going to get one of those this year. So for all you people that think Joe Williams takes over that backfield in San Fran, Samaj P. Ryan, there is, what's the, I don't know, divide 10 by 424. 4 into 34, right? What is that? What is that, like 1.5 or 2% chance of, of one of those happening? I just want you to have the numbers in your head. So before you think like they're the next coming of Jordan Howard or David Johnson, they're statistically probably not. Even if one of those backs wins the job, if P. Ryan wins the job in Washington, it's not like a great, it's not a great place to be stuck in. You're still gonna be, anyway, okay, I'm getting way off track here, but back to uh, Fournette, my concerns. So I don't see him having a much different skill, uh, much different position than Todd Gurley. And you guys, you know, I'm I'm well documented on my how much I don't like Todd Gurley this year. I think they're in the same kind of predicament. They both have a very bad offensive line. Jacksonville's 27th per Football Outsiders, and they're in the bottom quarter of the NFL in terms of scoring, 19.9 points per game. Both have decent pass catching back already on their roster. Oh, there was such a good stat I saw on Twitter the other day that would pertain to Fournette. Let me see if I could find it. Okay, this is. I'll put it on the screen right now. Did you know that if a running back is on a bottom eight scoring offense, they have just a 7.3% chance of being an RB1? So, take that for however you want it, but Jacksonville, Los Angeles Rams, definitely bottom eight in scoring. They have a 7% chance of, oh my God, wait, hold on, check out this fucking deer walking across my lawn. Look at two of them, They're, I live in New Jersey and this, these deers love me. Look at those antlers, holy shit balls. They used to come with like seven of their kids. I'm gonna throw an apple at them right now while y'all are here if I have any. When I open the front door, they're gonna fucking run away though. Let me take the sticker off. I'm not trying to poison these little ninjas. This is like the longest team outlook I think I've ever done. They're about to run the fudge away. No, 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 no. <laughs> Ah, uh, you little bastards. I'm trying to give you an apple. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be a supplier here. Supply and demand. Y'all gonna starve, I'm gonna feed you. Whatever. Um, so, back to Leonard Fournette for like the fourth time. Looking back at Fournette, right? Despite his size, he was not a great blocker in college. I don't really have the numbers in front of me, but that's what every analyst pretty much has said. And he dropped eight of a 48 possible catchable passes at LSU. So he drops one out of every six passes. Now, you know, that's a small sample size, so that's a pretty significant amount of drops. Eight out of 48 passes. So those are two key pieces of playing on third down, right? Catching balls and being able to pass block. He also did not run out of the shotgun at all at LSU. And that is the prime, that was the primary offense for Jacksonville last year, which is another concern because you see guys like Adrian Peterson who are not you know, their splits between under center and shotgun are much different. Like he's much worse with one and, than the other. And I would have said that that's a concern for Fournette, but Jacksonville did come out and sign a few fullbacks 
this off they brought I think they brought like two or three onto their roster so they probably will be changing their off offensive plan but that's just kind of another variable to throw into the mix I guess you know I get it as their fourth overall pick they want to use them as the workhorse of course I'm just I don't think it plays out as smoothly as just people just assume it's going to he's going to be getting 20 to 25 carries a game you look at, at the touchdown opportunities as well and on a low scoring team how, how many goal line carries is he going to get last year Chris Ivory led the Jaguars in rush attempts inside the five he only had seven, which was tied for 22nd in the NFL, and Yeldon had just one. So you're thinking like, hey, maybe now they take away some of the passing in that zone and give it to Fournette, but they didn't pass that much down there either. Bortles ranked 23rd amongst quarterbacks in terms of pass attempts inside the 10. So if, if volume is all you're looking for, sure, Fournette is, is a really good play, can be your guy, especially in standard leagues and in a league that, you know, maybe pass catching is not as as big of a part of your success as you need it to be. Fournette could be a great play. Someone uh, messaged me on Twitter yesterday. He had McCoy in the standard league. He was asking me if he should do the trade. McCoy for, he was getting offered Gurley and Fournette in a standard league. I said, yes, absolutely, you have to take that trade. So while I don't like Gurley or Fournette, that's gonna be 40 to 45, 40 to 50 carries a week that you're getting in a standard league. I know, like, I love McCoy, obviously a great talent, but you, you're passing up on a second and possibly third round pick for, for one first round pick. I'm not sure if McCoy even goes first round if he's in a standard league. Anyways, just giving you a perspective of where I'm at. So basically, yeah, there's no question Jacksonville wants to be run oriented, hard nosed football team. You know, they want to mask Bortles as, as much as they possibly can. It's a good, it's a good start for them. It, it just seems to me that Fournette right now as 2017 is more of a, a volume play. In 2018, they should have a new quarterback under center. I can't imagine them going forward with Bortles. And I'm all for Fournette being like a top five pick next year going into 2018. But where he's getting drafted right now, 22nd overall RB11, I would rather take Doug Baldwin, Lamar Miller, or Travis Kelsey in that same range. If you think of Travis Kelsey last year, gave you 1,100 yards, and I think he only scored four touchdowns, but how much better is Fournette gonna do at the running back position? He's gonna give you 1,400 total yards and, and eight touchdowns? Eh, probably not. So, you know, if he falls to me, if I'm standing there and I don't like any of my options and it's late third round, I'm like pick 28, 29, and a lot of my options are off the board, sure, I'll take Fournette because I don't hate 18 to 20 carries a game. I just think he does lose pass catching work, doesn't get as many goal line opportunities. But let's talk about the pass catching work. I said that they already had a decent pass catcher on their team. That's TJ Yeldon. He caught 50 passes last year, which is pretty impressive for a running back. He was tied for seventh in the NFL with 68 targets among running backs. So he saw a lot of volume. While he was efficient in terms of like yards per reception, yards per catch, they're clearly comfortable with him on third downs, somewhere where Fournette struggles to catch the ball and to block. So there's no reason to keep him on the field for that third down if they see Yeldon as the better guy. I know they use the pick on him, but like Tom Coughlin's not stupid. And Yeldon's already receiving praise at camp uh, for his pass blocking. The coaches are recognizing it and it's going to be how he gets on the field. And that's how he sees his snap. So if it's not Fournette on the field, I would assume it's Yeldon. Behind them too is obviously Chris Ivory. He's kind of buried on the depth chart now with Fournette there because he was like the power back and he's coming off by far the worst season of his like seven year tenure in the NFL. Although, you know, he, I was a fan of Ivory as a player. At least 4.1 yards per carry in the three seasons prior with the New York Jets. He was a good bruiser, six foot, 225, so really good size. If nothing else, he'll be like a breather for Fournette. If he gets tired, he can come in and, and you know, still handle the rock and run guys over. But I'm definitely not investing any, any picks into this backfield besides Fournette. And neither is obviously the fantasy community. Both of them are going undrafted, like way past pick 200. So, And then th there also has been a few rumors this offseason about maybe one of them getting cut. There was first yelled and then Ivory. I, I don't know if either of it's going to happen. But if they do, a name to keep an eye on is Corey Grant. 25-year-old kid. Runs a 4-2-8-40, so elite NFL speed. He's a name to monitor in like very deep dynasty leagues. I'm just throwing this out for people who play in the dynasty leagues. If you want to maybe handcuff Fournette, he could be a guy. So that's kind of my wrap up. I'm sorry for this video being so long, but I hope I gave you good info on Fournette. I hope I gave you good info on Allen Robinson. If you enjoyed the video, please give it that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Go follow me on the Twitter. And I want to leave you with a question, as always. Okay, so who are you taking? Out of these five, you could pick two. Half point PPR. Fournette, Gurley, Baldwin, Kelsey, and Lamar Miller. Three running backs, Miller, Gurley, Fournette, tight end Travis Kelsey, and Doug Baldwin. They're all going in the same. Actually, Gronkowski's probably up there closer in that range, but I think he's the easy pick if he's there, so I'm not going to put him in there. But answer that question. Comment down below. Let me know. And let me know what you thought about this team outlook. I'm tired after that one, man. I'll see y'all in the last team outlook, the Indy Colts, baby. Let's get it.